Today I'd like to focus a little more on priesthood, more so than what is going on in, in uh, the Book of Mormon, at least what I'll be talking about today. Uh, well, I guess first things first, Nephi, son of Helaman, is being uh, bullied by a crowd of judges and, and uh, corrupt Nephites who want to uh, uh, destroy his reputation, who want to bring false claims against him, have him punished according to crimes. Uh, and Nephi is, is prophetically defying them at every turn, every step of the way. As a matter of fact, he goes on to, to uh, uh, prophesy that uh, uh, the chief judge, I believe his name is Caesarum, had just been murdered by his own brother. This is how crazy the corruption is in, uh, in, 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 in the scriptures. I mean, it's not just limited to the Book of Mormon. It's also in the Bible, brother killing brother or, or father or whatever. It's just crazy. I, I just, it's not, I can't even, I can't, I, I can't fathom that, you know, killing your own brother. And what kind of people do these things? So anyway, after a lot of hoopla and, and people, and, uh, you know, five, five, five Nephites go, go to prison because they're the ones that were found um, by the chief judge's uh, body. Um, and they were the ones who were supposed to go and find out whether or not Nephi was telling the truth. You're going to have to just read uh, Helaman chapter 9 on your own for this. It's a lot of, a lot of uh, interesting uh, whodunit going on here. So anyway, uh, Nephi does not seek his own life. Uh, people are trying to destroy him, his reputation. They want him to hang, basically, because they don't like what he's saying about them. People in charge don't like to be told when they're wrong, when they've made mistakes. It's just, it's just crazy. King Noah was that way. They, they, they found an accusation against Abinadi because he came to prophesy of Jesus Christ, but they would spare his life if he took back what he said about them. You see how that changes? Instead of instead of uh, accusing him of blasphemy or heresy, no, they want to punish him because of the things he said about them. Same thing with the with these chief judges. Uh, and as I quoted uh, in my previous video, Third Nephi chapter six, I believe, or seven. Even the high priests were in on it. The Nephites, the high priests, the judges. Corruption was everywhere, and they don't like being told when they're wrong. They don't like being exposed. Anyway, okay, I'm, I'm getting, I'm going too far off on a tangent. So these people are trying to bring Nephi down, and he, he uh, foils their 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 every attempt until finally uh, things are cleared up between the other other judges. Uh, witnesses are brought forth, and Nephi's name is cleared. And uh, the chief judge's brother is is then uh, um, found out. So after everything is said and done, the dust falls and everybody goes their separate ways. Nephi is left standing there by himself. People go left and people go right, and there he is, just standing by himself. Just poof, everything that just happened. He's he's taking it all in, pondering the things that the Lord had just revealed to him. So. <clears throat> in Helaman chapter 10, which is what I want to focus on now, uh, Nephi's, he starts walking home. And it came to pass that Nephi went his way towards his own house, pondering upon the things which the Lord hath shown unto him. And it came to pass, as he was thus pondering, being much cast down because of the wickedness of the people of the Nephites, their secret works of darkness, and their murderings, and their plunderings, and all manner of iniquities. And it came to pass, as he was thus pondering in his heart, behold, a voice came unto him, saying, now we're in verse 4 of Helam in chapter 10, Blessed art thou, Nephi, for those things which thou hast done. 
For I have beheld how thou hast with unwearyingness declared the word which I have given unto thee, unto this people, and thou hast not feared them, and hast not sought thine own life, but thou hast sought my will, and to keep my commandments. And it's always the Lord's will to save his people, to heal them, to gather them. But but people love Babylon too much. They love money and shiny things. Verse 5. And now, because thou hast done this with such unweariness, behold, I will bless thee forever, and I will make thee mighty in word and in deed, in faith and in works. Yea, even that all things shall be done unto thee according to thy word. For thou shalt not ask that which is contrary to my will. And this is the good part. I love this right here. Verse 6. Behold, thou art Nephi, and I am God. Behold, I declare it unto thee in the presence of mine angels, that ye shall have power over this people, and shall smite the earth with famine, and with pestilence, and destruction, according to the wickedness of the people. Behold, I give unto you power, not just authority as we suppose that, that's attached to the Melchizedek priesthood in our church today, that whatsoever ye shall seal on earth shall be sealed in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, and thus shall ye have power among this people. And thus, if ye shall say unto this temple, it shall be rent in twain, it shall be done. And if ye shall say unto this mountain, be thou cast down, and become smooth, it shall be done. And behold, if ye shall say that God shall smite this people, it shall come to pass. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. <clears throat> in verse 6, where, where the Lord says, Behold, thou art Nephi, and I am God, and I declare it unto thee in the presence of mine angels. You know, in the church we talk about priesthood, and we define priesthood, you know, the old missionary definition, as, as I as I explained it uh, when I was a young missionary in Germany, is, you know, the, the priesthood is the authority to act in God's name. And while that is, and while that is true, there's so much more than that. Uh, and if you're watching this uh, and uh, and you're you're a male, well, you, chances are you have the Melchizedek, you have the Melchizedek priesthood. You have been ha hands have been laid upon your head, and you've been given the Melchizedek priesthood. Now, you can trace that line of authority back to back to Jesus Christ. Um, chances are your your dad laid hands on your head. And his dad laid hands on his head, and that's how the priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood authority was transmitted, and so on back. You know, maybe maybe his dad uh, received it from a general authority, who received it from another general authority, who received it from Joseph Smith, who received it from Peter, James, and John, who received it from Jesus Christ, etc. But see, this line of authority implies a genealogy, okay? And we read in, yeah, I believe it's in Hebrews chapter. 7 let's see hebrews chapter 7 and and <clears throat> you may or may not be familiar with this but there are there are people out there who study the bible who are familiar with this uh hebrews chapter 7 we read for this melchizedek king of salem priest of the most high god who met abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him to whom also abraham gave a tenth part of all first being by interpretation, king of righteousness. And after that, also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So people assume, because of the way that this has been translated, that this individual, Melchizedek, didn't have a mom, didn't have a dad, has no genealogy, and so, you know, it's a mystery. But I'm going to suggest to you that this is referring to uh, the power, the priesthood. Now, priesthood, personally speaking, I define as uh, an association, priesthood, like a neighborhood and the neighborhood is an association of neighbors. And so a priesthood is an association of priests. And so here in Helaman chapter 10, verse what I just read, 
6, Behold, thou art Nephi, and I am God. I declare it unto thee in the presence of mine angels. So here we see an association being demonstrated between God and now Nephi and also angels. Okay? Uh, and this association, this power that is granted is given by the calling of God's own voice. And this, this transmission of power by God's own voice, there's no genealogy there to, to, to uh, record. What is recorded is a transmission of power by the voice of God. And I believe, and I'd like to suggest to you, that that is what is being referred to here in the book of Hebrews. Okay, and this is the power that this Melchizedek possessed. Melchizedek being translated as king of righteousness. Now there are some traditions, and <clears throat> I spent a lot of time studying this, and I'm not going to go into the the ins and outs of the, the possibility that Melchizedek was Shem, the son of Noah. And, and, and there are people out there that will say, oh yeah, and I can show you how and why. And there are people that can say, oh no, 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 and I can show you how and why. But it, personally speaking, it's not conclusive either way. But I am certainly open to the possibility that Melchizedek was Shem. Because Shem's wife's name was Sedek et Lebab. Sedek meaning righteousness. And so Melchizedek is a, as a compound word, means king of righteousness. So you, <clears throat> you have, of course, Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem, and, of course, his, his wife. Just like Jesus Christ is the king of Israel, his bride. So you can see, you can see a, a, a similitude here. Now, taking this a little bit further... Uh, in the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, and I hope you're familiar with this. You should be, and if not, it's time to get familiar with it. In, Gen in Joseph Smith's translation of Genesis chapter 14, we read, And Melchizedek lifted up his voice and blessed Abraham. So this is kind of the same thing that we're reading, that we just read about in Hebrews. Now Melchizedek was a man of faith who wrought righteousness, and when a child he feared God and stopped the mouths of lions and quenched the violence of fire. And thus having been approved of God, he was ordained and high priest after the order of the covenant which God made with Enoch. So, so there's some precedent here. It being after the order of the Son of God, which order came, here we go, not by man, nor the will of man, neither by father nor mother, neither beginning of days nor end of years, but of God. So here it is, talking about not by a genealogy, not by a line of authority, no mom, no dad, just like I just read to you in Hebrews, and it was delivered unto men by the calling of his own voice, according to his own will, unto as many as believed on his name. And now we just saw this uh, evident in Nephi's life just now in, in Helaman chapter 10. By the calling of God's own voice was this power transmitted to Nephi. Okay? This power has no genealogy, no line of authority. It's, it's directly from God to the individual. Okay? Uh, moving along. To put, or for God having sworn unto Enoch and unto his seed with an oath by himself. You see, God himself is delivering this oath that everyone being ordained after this order and calling should have power by faith to break mountains, to divide the seas, to dry up waters, to turn them out of their course, to put at defiance the armies of nations, to divide the earth, to break every band, to stand in the presence of God, to do all things according to His will, according to His command, subdue principalities and powers, and this by the will of the Son of God, which was from before the foundation of the world. And there's some more things you can read about that in Alma chapter 13. So, uh... This demonstrates that while me personally, while hands were laid upon me and Melchizedek priesthood was transmitted to me, it is a certain degree, not the, not the same fullness that was delivered to Enoch or Melchizedek or, as we just read, Nephi by the calling of God's own voice. I don't have the power to move mountains the way God gave Nephi the power to, to uh, move a mountain. By faith, if it was expedient in the Lord, I absolutely could. could. But I am not authorized to do so. Okay? I, I shared another video of other miracles that I have experienced. Uh, things that I have done. 
to demonstrate that miracles still uh, occur today, as we read, uh, as, as, as Moroni may lament in Moroni chapter 7, does faith still exist in the last days? Yes, they do. And I'm a witness that faith, there is still faith, faith to heal, faith to do miracles. Uh, and it is by faith, but only after inquiring and praying and asking the Lord if it is his will, and if it is, then I go ahead and do it. But otherwise, unlike Nephi or Enoch or Melchizedek, I don't have that authority to just, to just, you know, uh, of my own will go and move a mountain just because I think it's cool. That, that would be crazy and chaos if, if you have all these Melchizedek priesthood holders in the church just doing all these things of their own will. You have to align your will with God's. And that's why God told Nephi, you shall not do anything contrary to my will. We have to know what God's will is and be aligned with his will. And when you have been trusted with uh, his work, the way Nephi shown to be trustworthy, then uh, after having been proved, like I just read in Joseph Smith translation, uh, Genesis chapter 14, then you stand approved and God gives to you this power because you can be trusted with his power. And God knows that, you, that your will is aligned with his will. Until then, my priesthood is limited uh, solely to those uh, of the office of an elder. And you can read about that in the Doctrine and Covenants. Something I want to read to you about uh, Bruce R. McConkie. Some of you may have this. It's the, the uh, first edition of the Mormon Doctrine under Melchizedek. Bruce R. McConkie declared, page 431, there is a false tradition to the effect that Melchizedek was the same person as Shem, the son of Noah. That this was not the, that this was not the case is seen from the revelation which says, Abraham, quote, Abraham received the priesthood from Melchizedek, who received it through the lineage of his fathers, even till Noah, D&C, section 84, verse 14. In other words, there were at least two generations between Melchizedek and Shem, and they could not have been more closely related than grand, or sorry, great-grandfather and great-grandson, if the relationship was that close. But see, Bruce R. McConkie, I love Bruce R. McConkie, but, you know, and even though he got some things right, he still got a lot of things wrong, and that's why, that's why there are updated uh, editions of the Book of Mormon corrected, okay? Bruce R. McConkie makes the assumption in this scripture that those who received it through the lineage of his fathers, even till Noah, well, he's, th he's looking backwards, Genealogy is, is a timeline, and he's 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 reconciling it from from uh, from the present to the past instead of from the past to the present. Now, let me read it like this. Let me render it this way, and you can think about it. Abraham received the priesthood from Melchizedek, who received it through the lineage of his fathers from Adam, even till Noah. Now it makes sense, doesn't it? Yes, because Adam through Noah were the patriarchs. And they had the rights of the fathers. And Abraham wanted the rights of the fathers. And so there was somebody that needed to hang around to bless Abraham with the rights of the fathers. And that's why I personally believe, I'm not going to make the claim authoritatively that it's true, that Shem was given another name or a name title, and that was Melchizedek. And Melchizedek was the king of Salem, king of peace, uh, Prince of Peace, sorry, he was known as the Prince of Peace. And uh, consider the possibility that after he blessed Abraham, and Abraham then was able to become a father and pass, pass this um, right down to Isaac and Jacob and so on, then there was no more need for Melchizedek or Shem to remain on the earth, and he was translated, taken up with Salem, just like Enoch was taken up with, uh, with his city. So there... there now, there's a lot, there's, I'm just taking snippets here, and, and there's, there's a lot to unpack with a lot of the things that I just said. But this brings me back to Helaman chapter 10, where the Lord is speaking directly to Nephi and giving him power over the elements in order to persuade the people to repent. The people did not have sufficient reason to believe in God, 
until Nephi showed them through his prophesying. And some of them thought, well, he must be a god. I mean, instead of, in, I mean, these are Nephites who should already be versed in the gospel. They've got the, they've got the record, they've got the plates, they've got the scriptures, and they still, they still don't understand. So, Nephi is, is, uh, is given power to persuade the people to repent. And he, he and he uh, uses that power to cause a uh, famine. Rather than outright destroying the people, he asked the Lord permission because he did not want to overstep his bounds. He was very cautious about, about the power given to him. That's a lot of power to wield. And so he asks the Lord to send a famine to persuade the, the people to repent. And of course, they end up repenting. Okay, They realize, oh, Nephi sending a famine and we're starving to death and we're dying. So we're going to repent. Now they had sufficient reason to believe that not only was Nephi a prophet, he was a prophet of a true God. A true God who wants to gather them as a hen gathereth her chickens and heal them. Okay, this is over 20 minutes, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it here. I'm giving you a lot to think about to be continued.